okay? All right, so with that said, we have reached the end of our study of the book of Galatians today, or really of the letter that Paul wrote to these churches in the region of Galatia. And if you've been with us at all, then when we get to the end here in a minute, you're going to go, wow, that sounds different. He ends the letter kind of ironically, and I say kind of because when you understand what he's actually saying, you realize, oh, oh, there's no conflict between these two things. But until you do, you're like, whoa, that's a little bit different. Like, because he's been consistent. Paul is nothing if not on message, and on message for nine straight weeks, he's been coming to me, and he's been coming to you, and he's going, I'm begging you to understand that when it comes to gaining or keeping the favor of God, the love of God, the heaven of God, like I die someday, am I going to heaven or not? The family of God, like how do I become a son or daughter of the king, like authentically, really holy, and know it when it comes to gaining or keeping these things? There is literally nothing you can do. Zero, nada, not one thing. Why? Well, he's been giving us reasons. We've looked at a whole bunch of those reasons. Let me give you an additional one. It's the standard. So there is a standard by which everyone, everywhere, me, you, the whole of humanity that has ever lived, will one day be judged by, sounds a little intimidating, and it is, God who is the judge of the universe. And it's not the standard of your mom or mine. It's just, it's not going to be that. Like, it's not like you die, you go to heaven, you get to stand before God, and you go, listen, I feel pretty safe in this moment. I feel like this is going to go well for me. I'm a good person. Just ask my mom. I mean, you could be an axe murderer, and your mom would be like, oh, little Johnny, who's, you know, meanwhile, 45. He's just misunderstood. No, he should be in prison. You know, like, that's not the standard. It's not the standard of our culture, which... Parenthetically, I'm not sure has a standard anymore. I think the only standard that our culture has at this point is that you can't have any standards. The only evil thing left is to say that anything is evil. That's where we're at. But let's say, for example, that you can measure yourself off against everyone else, you know? Like, it's not like you're going to step into God's presence and go, I feel pretty good in this moment. And the reason I feel pretty good in this moment is because, I mean, I don't mean to brag or anything, but I'm pretty sure I'm in the top 50% of humanity in terms of, I don't know, morality as defined by... Take your pick. It doesn't work that way. It's not the standard of your own self, which, incidentally, I mean you haven't lived up to. Can we just say that? It's true for me too. I mean, the reality is if you've took everything I said or that you said about how somebody else should live, oh, here's how they ought to think. Here's how they ought to vote. Here's how they ought to be. Here's what they ought to say. Here's what they shouldn't say. Here's what they should do. All the advice that you've ever given, all the criticisms that you've levied against anyone else, and then you apply that to your own life. I mean, listen, the ship sinks quickly. We all of us suffer from a level of hypocrisy that dooms us by our own standard. My goodness, how would we ever even dream that we could possibly live up to the standard of God, which, parenthetically, is God himself? Take that in for a second. He's the standard. So his perfect righteousness, the standard, his holiness the standard, his goodness, the standard, his love, his compassion, his justice, his mercy, his, all of that is God, the glory of God. That's the standard. Okay, well, now we're done, are we not? So Paul's been coming to us, and where have we been? We've been on a treadmill, but we think we've been going somewhere. And he's like, no, you're still in the living room, guys. Like, and you can run as fast as you want, and you can run as hard as you want, and you can run as long as you want, and when you step off, you're still in the living room. You're going nowhere if you think that by your efforts, you can purchase, you can earn, you can deserve at all anything from the Lord. Not going to work. But then having created this peril in our hearts, because, I mean, that's sort of terrifying. Paul rushes to our relief with Jesus. He's like, you know who Jesus is, right? Jesus is God. So think about that. He is God through a supernatural conception, made man, clothed in our humanity, the perfect representation of humanity, who also happens to be God, who entered into this world to live the only good-as-God life that has ever been lived by any human being, and who then took upon himself all of our failure and put it to death in his body on a cross, and in the meantime, took like a garment all of his perfect righteousness 
And he clothes us in it. It doesn't, it's not like he takes away our failure and leaves us morally neutral or naked. No, he takes away our failure. He clothes himself with it. He crucifies it and does away with it for forever. And then he gives us his perfect righteousness. And when God now looks at me or you, if you have faith in Jesus, trust me, we have no reason to fear any kind of judgment or any kind of an issue with God at all. Favor of God, of course it's yours. Just look at you. You're covered in his performance. Love of God, come on. How can he deny that? Heaven of God? Do I have to worry about whether I'm going to go to heaven or not? No. Why? Because I have no hand in this. <laughs> he did it all for me. Jesus dies on the cross. He doesn't say, hey, listen, it's mostly finished. I left a little bit for you guys to do. He says, it is finished. I've left nothing for you to do. You're invited into the family of God based on my performance. I have paid your debt, and I have set you free. Okay, that's amazing. It's phenomenal. And so for nine weeks, at least as we've measured out this book, Paul's been coming to us and going, yeah, that. Yeah, that. Oh, did you get that? Oh, hey, but how about that? He's been saying, stop trying if this is what you're trying to gain. Stop doing if this is what you're trying to gain. Stop striving if this is what you're trying to gain. Stop working if this is what you're trying to gain. Today, somewhat ironically, until you realize he's speaking in a very different sense, he's going to come to us and go, okay, so before I sign off on the book, here's what I need to say to you guys. Here it is. You ready? Get to work. There is a marvelous, amazing work opportunity like for you, and it is incredible, and I don't want you to miss it. And by the way, if you really do have Jesus living in you by the power of the Holy Spirit, if you really have appropriated his forgiveness and are covered in his righteousness, if the reality of this salvation and what he has done for you has taken its effect in your heart, if you've been embraced by that love, you will work. You'll want to work. You'll be like, sign me up for the work. Good works are the natural, organic, and inevitable byproduct of authentic faith in Jesus. They just start happening. Then it's amazing. And you're all about it. And you're like, this is fantastic. And sometimes you're surprised by yourself. Because you look at yourself now, and you look at yourself then, and you're like, I'm doing stuff I would have never imagined doing then. What is that? That is the reality. That is the proof of the reality of your faith. The way that I like to think about this, and I've used this in the past, so you're welcome, is the idea of a wood-burning fireplace. Now I have to use wood-burning because now everybody has a gas-burning fireplace. I mean, I realize none of us have fireplaces. Okay, maybe three of us and you're weird, right? I mean, that's just an oddity in your house. We live in South Florida. Today, we for sure don't need a fireplace. Maybe twice a year when we're feeling lucky, all right? But up north, everybody has one, and now there's gas, which is so, forgive me, it's so much better. You don't have to chop wood. You don't have to buy wood. You don't have to have it delivered. You don't need to cart it in the house. You don't need to sweep up after you do. You don't need to find newspaper if you can even do that, which I think you can't. So now I'm showing my age. You know, these little blocks, these little bricks, these little starter kits. That's probably better. We could use those. I don't have to do that. It's gas burning. Anyway, you just have to sit back on your couch and go boop, and it goes whoo, right? No smoke. It's fantastic. Heats the whole room. It's efficient. It's cheap. Anyway. I'm not selling you a fireplace today. I, I am, however, trying to get you to get an idea, and I want you to image in your mind a wood-burning, old-fashioned fireplace with a chimney. Okay, let's say, for example, that you have a house with a wood-burning fireplace and a chimney, and I go for a walk in the neighborhood. Do I need to go in your house to figure out whether or not you're having a fire in your fireplace? It's a simple answer. Of course not. I mean, if we're in Florida, I'm like, what the heck? Is the Everglades on fire? Like, what is, what could that possibly be? But if I'm in North Carolina, I'm like, okay, so who's got the fire? You know, and I just, I look around at the chimneys and because everybody has one and oh, there it is. There's the fire. If there's a fire in the fireplace, smoke is coming out of the chimney. If it's a big fire, it's belching out. If it's like a tiny little fire, like you could take a match 
you know, and you can strike the match and throw it into the fireplace. And I don't know why this happens, but the match only burns about halfway down. Have you noticed that? Like, why does it stop? It's not like it, the rest of it isn't wood or something. But in any event, it will burn down. And this tiny little trail of smoke will go up. And if the flue on the fireplace is open, very important piece of information, it will go all the way up, and then it'll come out the top of the chimney. And now, in that case, I might need to get up on the roof of your house. I might need to, like you know, like smell it right where it comes out. I might need to get sensitive equipment to determine whether, in fact, there is actually smoke. But the second smoke is verified, I know what's going on in the fireplace, and that is to say that it has a fire in it. There is no such thing in a wood-burning life where there's a fire and no smoke. So it is with good works. If there's a fire in here, Okay, the smoke of good works is coming out of the chimney of your life. Not sometimes, but in every case. Now, sometimes there's more than less. Some seasons of life, there's more than, you know, some. But man, if, if you're alive in here, if the Spirit of the living God, who spoke the worlds into being, is in here... Stuff changes out here. Think of the metaphors of salvation. You've been transferred, we're told, by Paul elsewhere from darkness to light. That's not like a little bit dramatic, but it's even more. From death to life. Think of the difference. Dead, nothing. Living, come on. Let's go. Paul's like, look, here's the deal. You have been saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. He has been pounding that nail with his hammer nine weeks in a row. Today he adds a phrase, and the phrase is, but not by a faith that is alone, but instead you are saved, if your faith is authentic, by a faith, if that fire is in here, that naturally, organically, and inevitably produces, well, good works. And he doesn't just say that in Galatians. He says it in every book that he writes. The first half of the book is all about the fire. It's the gospel. It's what God has done for you. And he alone, and through faith in Christ alone, this is who you are, and this is what you receive, and all of these. It's, it's fire, and then it's smoke. Here's how to live. It's fire, and then it's smoke. Here's how to live. It's fire, and then it's smoke. Here's how to work through his letters. Again and again and again and again, you see the same thing. He says it all over the place. Most clearly, in my opinion, he says it in Ephesians 2, beginning in verse 8. Very famous statement on the fire of salvation to which we contribute zero. Don't miss it. But now that I'm a new creation, now that I'm his handiwork, his workmanship, now that he's made me alive instead of dead and I'm walking in light instead of darkness, now all of a sudden there's like, he's like, yeah, you know, there's fire and here's the smoke. Listen for what he says. For by grace you have been saved, how? Through faith, there it is, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God from beginning to end and not a result of works, meaning of any work on your behalf. Why? So that no one may boast in anything or anyone but Jesus. He gets all the credit. Not a one of us or anyone else will ever get to heaven and go, you know, Lord, I'm so grateful that you made most of my salvation possible, but while we're handing out the kudos, let me give myself a little pat on the back. Are you kidding me? He did it all he had to. What's the standard? God himself. Now we're out. But he's in for us. So by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one can boast of anything or anyone but Jesus. And now that he's given us the fire, he starts to talk about the smoke. He says, and we are his workmanship. When you get to his letter to the Corinthians, one of his letters, he says, listen, if, you, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. You've been newly created. Life out of death. Light out of darkness. You are appreciably, fundamentally, constitutionally different. Here he uses the idea of, of workmanship, of craftsmanship. We are his workmanship, we who have been saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works. Why do you build a chimney with your fireplace? Because you want to get the smoke out of the house 
And that's the purpose. A chimney has a purpose. You have a purpose. The only question is, and it's where I'm going, is are you living out your purpose? Because if you're not, you're missing it. I don't want you to miss it. Chimney has a purpose. God's like, I've got a purpose, so here's the deal. You've been created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should what? Walk in them. Why does the word walk matter? Because it's a metaphor for life in the New Testament. And he's saying, listen, here's the deal. You become a Christian, and here's how it doesn't work. It doesn't work that you become a Christian, and God says, all right, I got a checklist of like nine things I want you to do. And then when you're done with that, you can go back and live for yourself again. He's like, no, no, no. I inhabit you. I have a mission that is the rest of your life. I have a mission that encompasses everything you're already doing. Like, you don't have to, like, make time for this. This just comes in and says, now all of a sudden you're on mission where you work, or now all of a sudden you're on mission with all your hobbies and where you play, and now you're on mission in your home and with your friendships and with your family and all of this stuff. God's like, you don't have to go out and find new things. Now, he may lead you to do that, but he's like, no, 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 I'm coming and I'm sweeping up all of this stuff, and I'm telling you, I've got a list of amazing things that we're going to do in every area of your life as you are converted, not just from death to life, but as you learn to live, you're converted into the image of my own son. So nine weeks, he's like, stop working. This week, he's like, oh man, I have such an opportunity for you. I want you to get to work. And know that when you start doing the things that I have made you to do, that I, by my Spirit, gift you to do, that I am in it with you and empowering you to do, it's the most satisfying, purposeful, meaningful work that you're going to get to do. Like you finally feel like I hit the sweet spot of life. I'm on mission. It matters. There's meaning. And somehow, miraculously, and it is literally that, God is going to make a difference through me. What a wonderful and amazing opportunity. And look, Paul's not the only one who says all of this. You find it through the writings of all over the New Testament. But let me give you the most famous statement on this. It certainly, I think, is the clearest. James, the half-brother of Jesus, says this in James 2, beginning in verse 14. He says, What good is it, my brother? Now follow his logic. If someone says with his mouth, because that's how you speak, that he has faith, that is to say, I have real and authentic faith, but does not have works... To back up that claim to faith, he says, can that faith save him? Is it real? Is it authentic? Is it saving faith? I mean, he's telling me he's got a fire in the fireplace and there's zero coming out of the chimney. Am I believing this? I mean, if it's a gas fireplace, but that's not what we're talking about. No. No is the answer. And he answers it with an analogy. He says, if a brother or sister in Christ, so a fellow believer in Jesus, is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and then one of you says with your mouth to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, you know, without also giving them the things needed for the body, without helping them in any possible way, he says, what good is that? It answers itself. It's no good. Everybody knows that immediately. So also, he then says, Faith that you claim to have with your mouth, but that is by itself, if it does not have works to back up that claim, is not a sick faith, it's not a weak faith, it is a dead faith. It is a smokeless fire, and that's a non-entity, that doesn't exist. That isn't possible. It doesn't work. He's going, look, you can't be a new creature and literally have zero, not a nothing, new in your life. You, you can't have God's word authentically take root in your heart and produce zero, not a nothing in terms of fruit through your life. You can't be a follower of Jesus who never follows Jesus and isn't even bothered by that. And parenthetically, that's what Jesus also says. And not just once, all over the place. Let me just give you sort of a shotgun blast. In John 14, verse 12, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do what? The works that I do. Three verses later, he says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Six verses after that, he says, Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. Two verses after that, he says, If anyone loves me, 
he will keep my word. The next verse after that, he says, whoever does not love me does not keep my words. Next chapter, verse 14, he says, you are my friends if you do what I command. I like this in Luke eleven twenty-eight 28, though. Listen to what he says. He says, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and then do what with it? Like, you know, ignore it, avoid it, try to make it say something that it doesn't. How about this one? I'll just take it under advisement. Do you ever think about that? Because I do that, like guilty, okay? Yeah, I'm sorry, you're guilty too. We all do this. It's like, I'll think about that at some point. You know, like, I'll think about that. What that means is no, and I hope you forget about it, Lord, which, by the way, he doesn't. But can you imagine that from Because it's comical, okay? If you really kind of put everything in the right category, beginning with God, and then after that, everything gets categorized properly, including me and you, that's almost laughable, Like, here is the Lord of the universe, the all-wise one who declares the end from the beginning, the creator of absolutely everything and everyone, the one who creates all things physically and morally, who knows everything, and who comes to us in love, quite frankly, with his commandments, and says, here, I want you to do this, I don't want you to do that, and you're like, I think I'll take that under advisement. Does he laugh when that happens? Like, is he like going, oh, can you believe that they're taking it under advice? But he's doing it again. Like, what do the angels who stand in his presence think in that moment? Are they going, oh, can you believe it? He's going to think about it. It's nonsensical. Look, there's grace for all our failures. I think we got that, right? Like, we, I want you to hear that. That's important. But he starts with this word. In this verse, he says, blessed. Okay, just If we had a sign-up for that, if that was on the app, oh, you want to be blessed by God? Well, just go to the features button, and then you kind of flip down, and then at the bottom, we've got like a little tile there, and then you can click that, and you can fill out a form, and then the Lord God is going to bless you. We would blow the internet up. Everything would crash because everybody's in. You don't even know what that means. Blessed, whatever that is, I want it from the Lord. Okay, well, here it is. Blessed rather are you or are those who hear the word of God and keep it. So let me be super plain about this. On some level, it is absolutely true that obedience brings blessing. And you can just play that out in your life. If you looked at everything that you regret in life, and I'm not talking about we broke up with my girlfriend in middle school and I wish I hadn't. I mean, like, real regret, okay? Like the things that you wish, oh, if I could do anything, I could go back and I would change this. All of these things, and the longer you live, the longer the list. All of these regrets that you have in life, all of these things that have introduced suffering and pain, et cetera, et cetera. A large number of them, if you laid them down next to the word of the Lord, which is given to us to drive us to Jesus by exposing our failure, but also to keep us from regret, you'd realize that a whole bunch of the things, maybe even all of the things on my list of regret, I could have avoided entirely if I just listened to him. It's humbling. So maybe at this point you're thinking, all right, so Tom, are you saying that I'm not a real believer in Jesus if I honestly don't care at all about his word? Obedience is not on my radar I mean, I'm not even the match in the fire because I'm, I'm, I'm given some space for just a little bit as opposed to nothing. So if I don't care at all, is that what you're saying? Let me be really clear. That's what Jesus is saying. That's what James is saying. That's what Paul is saying. And what I'm doing is reading this to you and going, this is the word of the Lord. And it's sobering and thoughtful, and it should drive us to the one who rescues us from it entirely and then gives us the opportunity to be set on fire by the power of his spirit and actually used in meaningful, purposeful ways for as many days as he himself numbers out to us. It's powerful. Martin Luther put it this way, and I think he said it brilliantly. He uses the word religion, but here's what he means. He means true and authentic and saving faith. He says a religion or a faith that gives nothing, costs nothing, and suffers nothing, is ultimately worth nothing. Why? Because real faith gives. And I don't just mean financially, but I don't mean less than that. So like if that's an issue, you got to work that through with the Lord. What that's called is idolatry. 
So real faith gives. It takes seriously what he has to say about our money and finances, recognizing it's the number one rival God to the true and the living God. And it is the most corrosive thing, if we allow it to be, in our hearts and lives. But it's not just that, but it's also time. And let's face it, a lot of us would rather give money than time at this point. Like, this is more valuable to me than this. But it's not just time. It's also gifts and abilities and talents and so forth. Like, we are, if you look at the picture of the church, we are, to quote Paul elsewhere, we are like a body with Jesus as the head and each one of us being a part of the body. And all of the parts of the body matter. Every single one. And the whole body suffers for the lack of the involvement or the use of the one. We are to be a generous people. And here's what happens as we come to faith in Jesus and he fills us with his spirit and we surrender ourselves to him and we say, okay, Lord, I got it. You've got a mission and you've got some molding in me to do. And we get involved in his word and we do personal worship and we come on Sundays and we get involved in community and in learning and all of the things that we talk about here as he conforms you to the image of Jesus who is altogether generous, you discover you become more generous in all of those categories and in whatever other category there is. And you start getting th- two years down the road, three years down the road, maybe six months down the road, and you look back and go, man, I would have never done this then, but it is my joy to do this now. Real faith gives. Real faith is costly. It recognizes that Christ by his blood didn't purchase some small part of us. Hey, Lord, you get 20%. Hope you're happy. You know, like, feel good about that. I've never given, you know, like, I don't know. I claim the whole of you, which is a good thing because we don't just need to be saved from our sin. We need to be saved from ourselves and whatever lesser plans we would make for our lives than the plan that he has for us, which is the one that is purposeful and meaningful and satisfying, etc. It's the stuff where we get to do things that last for eternity as opposed to leave it all behind when we're done. He's like, man, I I purchased the whole of you. And here too, as we're conformed to the image of Jesus, who for the joy, hear that word because that's important, set before him, paid the cost that needed to be paid that he might purchase you. That is the cost of the cross. We start finding that it's our joy to pay the cost. So if I do this, this is what it's going to cost me in time. Or if I do this, this is what it's going to cost me in dollars. If I do this, this is what it's going to cost me in, in effort or whatever. Yeah, I'm in. It's my joy to do it. Like, I, I, I want to do it. It's exciting to me to be able to do it. It's fantastic. Real faith gives, real faith is costly, and real faith suffers. It suffers the indignity that is ours when we identify with Jesus and tell people, I'm a Christian, so now you think I'm crazy. Okay. It runs the relational risk of saying, hey, look, I'd love to talk to you about this. I think this might be helpful to you. I mean, let's be honest. In this country, we do not suffer much yet for the gospel. We don't. You start looking around the world, and it's quite amazing. I mean, we pray every week as a staff, and we send it out if you're on the prayer list. We send out the sheet, and it's beyond our borders as a whole section. And every week, we read about the suffering of Christians elsewhere in the world, and we pray for them, and it's like, Oh, boy, humbling and amazing. You know where the gospel is taking off? Where Christians are persecuted. That's where it's taking off because people realize there's a cost to be paid and then there is a God worthy of paying that cost in the service of. It's remarkable. So a religion or a faith that gives nothing, costs nothing, and suffers nothing is is ultimately worth nothing. Okay, so maybe you're getting nervous because we're studying Galatians, and I've just spent a ton of time outside of Galatians, and you're thinking, dude, it's Father's Day. Like, and this sandwich thing that's going on in the kitchen right now, what what the heck? Like, this is like torture? I mean, what did you do letting them do this? So are you going to get to Galatians or not? So what are you going to read from there? So let's just see what he says about this in Galatians And then I promise we're done. He says this in Galatians 6, verse 9. He says, And let those of us who what? Who understand that we've been saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. The first nine weeks. We get it. Okay. Let those of us who get that not grow weary of doing good. And then he goes all agricultural on us, and it's really helpful. 
He says, for if, and this is what he's saying, for if good works are what we sow in this life, and that's the time limit we've got. The clock's running. He's like, if we're sowing good works in this life, then in due season, either in this life or in the next or in both, we will reap, the point being, a great harvest if we do not give up. And it's tempting to give up at times. Just take your ball and go home. Put your noise-canceling headphones on. I don't know if you have that. They're $300. They're worth every penny. They should charge $1,000. It's fantastic. Go in your room, shut the door. I'm out. He's like, don't, don't be out. You're going to miss it. You've got seeds to plant and good soil that God has ordained to bring forth a great harvest. Now, it's up to him when, but it's going to happen. He says it's, it's about these, these good works sow and in due season we will reap that harvest if we do not give up. And so then he says, guys, we have an opportunity, which means we should be looking for opportunities. You find what you're looking for? As we have opportunity, he says, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Well said. I love what John Brown, who was a 19th century Scottish Presbyterian pastor and, and a commentator on the Bible, he did a commentary on Galatians, says. He says, every act of Christian duty, every sacrifice made, every privation submitted to, every suffering endured. Why? How? From a regard to Christ's authority, that's just to say in obedience to Jesus, and with a view to Christ's honor, that is to say to glorify Him, to advance His mission, shall assuredly be recompensed by God is the point, because every such act is what? It is a good seed, God is saying, that gets planted into good soil that has as its farmer and gardener the Lord God Himself. So He will tend it, He will water it, He will weed it, He will fertilize it, and He's not going to say, here's when it's going to come up out of the ground, but He's saying it's coming up out of the ground eventually, and man, you're going to be so happy when it does. How many seeds are you going to plant? Three or 300,000? Five or five million? What kind of harvest do you want? Plant some seeds. So to recap, we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, but not by a faith that is alone. That's, that's a fool's errand. That's a smokeless fire. That's not real, it's not authentic, it does not exist. We are saved instead by a faith that naturally, organically, and inevitably produces good works. And, you know, there's a fire in here. You can smell it out, right? You can see it. It's visible, it's sensible. It's real. So, in closing, I would ask you this. First of all, do you know Jesus? Because the standard, and I'm sure you probably heard this, was the scary part at the beginning. <laughs> the standard is not the standard of mom or of our culture or of our own selves. The standard is the standard of God himself. And by that standard, we are all undone. And yet, the relief is in Christ. Here he comes to the rescue. Though we did not deserve him at all, God in love sent him into the world for us that he might do what we have not done. Good is God life satisfying our debt by laying it down in sacrifice and clothing us in His righteousness. There is no fear on the day of judgment, just rejoicing for God's people. And it's rejoicing in Him. No one may boast except in Him. But man, if that's real in here to you, there should at least be the hint of, a, of some smoke. Like if we got out the detectors, because, I mean, let's, maybe it's just a little, you know, and we can very sensitive equipment, like there should be something of that faith that's being produced from that fire. And so question number two is, do you see evidence of your faith in the form of good works? Because you can't be a new creature and literally nothing new. You can't have his word take root in your heart, no fruit at all. You can't be a follower of Jesus who doesn't follow Jesus ever at any time and doesn't care. A religion or a faith that gives nothing, costs nothing, and suffers nothing is ultimately worth nothing because it isn't real. It doesn't exist. 
Do you see evidence of your faith in the form of good works? And then the last one is, what good works are you sowing in this season of your life? Because this is the season of opportunity. It's the season of sowing. And that which we sow, just like, you know, when you're a farmer, you reap, you know? I mean, you sow oranges, orange trees, you get oranges, right? You don't get peaches. You sow corn, you don't get okra. You're like, what even is okra? It's something you shouldn't eat unless it's battered and fried, okay? Just, that's how to eat it. Maybe in a soup, that's it. But that which you sow, you reap. He's saying, sow these good seeds of good works and entrust then to my farming and governing and gardening hand and know that I am promising you as the Lord God of the universe that there is a harvest coming. Don't give up. Don't give up. So we offer you the opportunity to come and ask your questions when the service is over and to pray with a wonderful group of people who are marvelously blessed of the Spirit for the purpose and for the ministry of prayer. And if you don't know Jesus, I'm just going to tell you, people come forward and they receive Jesus pretty commonly. Happened last week. It was wonderful. We would like nothing more than to see you go, yeah, if the standard is God, I'm done. But I don't want to be done. I like that whole idea of I'm forgiven and maybe then my life will have meaning and purpose. And Let's pray for you about that. If you're looking at your life and you're going, I don't see a lot of evidence. There's not, maybe there's a little smoke. But there used to be a bunch and I've given up. You know, like and I, I, need to, I need to rekindle here in some level. Let's lay hands on you and ask the Spirit to fill you and, and to ignite that fire in your heart again. And if you're looking at, at what you're sowing in life and realizing, I just need to reorient this and I need some power and wisdom by which to do it so that I can begin to plant seeds all the time trusting that the Lord for eternity will bring up a great harvest. And we would love to come alongside you and and pray for you in that regard as well. Okay? Do you know Jesus? Do you see the evidence of your faith in the form of good works? What good works are you sowing in this season of your life? Three seeds? 300,000. I like the later. The second one seems better. All right, let me pray for us.